UNST Tower to Baltimore. It uh, it opens up some scabs and some old wounds of the heart, but it also opens up quite the conversation. Now, uh, 33 and a half years later, uh, this week, as the ghost of Baltimore football pass comes to town, and I'm writing about that, of course, out at WNST.net. You can see our three part series there. But I'm trying to reach back and think of as many great guests to discuss this period of time during my lifetime in the, the late 70s of Burt Jones straight on through where we are with an 8-6 and six football team and our old Colts are there the Browns got nothing going on we've got their old team and this guy has been a part of the whole Bermuda Triangle of Baltimore, Ursay Modell, Cleveland the new Ursays and now resides in Indianapolis Indiana where he once coached and was a part of stacking said Mayflower truck on a March 1984 night. Former head coach, former uh, coordinator and assistant coach with the Baltimore Colts and the Indianapolis Colts. We welcome Rick Venturi on. Dude, I've only talked to you one time, but you made such an impression upon me as one of my favorite all-time dudes to talk to. So I am really tickled that you're going to come on here and tell me some old Mr. Ursay stories. <laughs> well, what a week, you know. As uh, You know, it really hits me as I prepare. As, as you know, I do a lot of cult stuff today. I've moved back to Indianapolis and made it my second career here, radio and television. But when I, you know, when I get ready here to see the Ravens, uh, it really brings it back like it were yesterday. And you're exactly right, Nestor. I was there that night. I, I remember that night, ugly, awful night. Um, and uh, I, I, uh, I was a part of that. I, I actually. Uh, my job that night was to take all the blackboards off the wall. We all had jobs, but it was eerie. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, you know, it was such a, a sad day at that time, no question about it. Um, you know, Baltimore was good to me. It was it was my first pro job, and even though even though that was probably the low ebb in uh, in Baltimore Colt football in ninety one there and ninety two uh, you know, I was thrilled to be there. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the O's were, of course, you know, they they had had an unprecedented ten straight years there, and so you know, it was a it was a very difficult thing. You know, the night we left, obviously. Well, and all these years later, uh, what has happened to the league and where they are, and has the league hit its head? And uh, you know, back in your day, it was it was football. Now it's so much money involved, and the decisions that are being made from Thursday night football and CTE, and just how easy it is to stay at home and watch the game on TV. Coach, you got to admit, when they bring that camera in now that skates over where the quarterback is, where you can see the field from ten feet above the quarterback. Quarterback's head. I mean, that just that just changes everything for the way you watch the game at home. I think it absolutely absolutely does. And they beg me, all my media buddies beg me to come down to the games. And I've got to admit, I'm one of those guys. I I would much rather watch the game on my on my big screen TV. Uh, I'm able to run the series back, which speeds up my my work the next day when I go to analyze the tape. Um, you know, I re I rerun it. You're exactly right. The Thursday night experiment, I love it. I don't know if the fans do, but you know, being an ex coach, I love that angle because I can see the coverage, I can see everything unfold, kind of like I did as a coach. And so, yeah, there isn't any question about it. I mean, you end up, you know, the the event itself now between the tickets, and if you bring a family. I mean, you're you're spending a ton of money when you can sit right there and, as you say, get the you know get the analysis and get the great great views. I, I find that I sometimes have a better feel because I actually can see body language. I can see the look in a guy's eyes that I couldn't even see when I was on the sidelines. Tell me about the team out there. Uh, you know, I know Chuck's in trouble. You know what that's like for families, for coaches, for staffs. Uh, you know, clearly when, I mean, the moral of the story is real simple, and we knew this going in. Everybody knows this. When your starting quarterback doesn't make it to the field, you really don't have much of a chance to win. You have to have a special, special group of other players as well as a special backup quarterback. And clearly the Indianapolis Colts that come in here are a, a fraction of what they were dreamed to be in the offseason. We had our own injury problems around here a couple months ago, but uh, the Colts have been hit harder than almost any other team. 
Well, there's no question about it. And, you know, Chuck, who's a, a great person, as you know, and has been a classy guy through this all, um, you know, it's almost like he's had two careers here. You know, he started off with a bang, um, you know, 36 and 18. Uh, he got to an AFC championship game almost as if, you know, and, and that happens a lot. If you have too much success early, then the expectations just get unsurmountable. You know, and then the last three years have been just the opposite. It's 19 and 28 in the last 47. Um, I think I think I saw today Luck has played 46, or I'm sorry, he's played uh, 26 or 24 of like the 48 games. It's something. It's 26 of the 48 uh, games in the last three years. You know, which means that he's played under 50 percent, and that's kind of what the team has become. Um, you know, basically, uh, he was a transformational quarterback, Nestor. You saw that. I think in 214, he played, he carried a franchise. He really did. He was, he played as good as anybody in the league, uh, actually, to get to that AFC championship game. And, you know, they, they certainly haven't been able to m- make up for his loss. And, you know, the other thing that happened to them is they didn't make the system work over a five year period. They had a lot of bad draft picks. You know, particularly the ones and twos over the years, um, and some turmoil lot. between Grigson and Chuck. You know, just where the, yeah, you, it, it, and that's never good when they're not. Seeing yeah, and they eye. wasted. You know, they wasted money on, on on a lot of very average free agents. They overpaid it, and thus, you know, the roster the roster really never got better. It got worse. It got progressively worse. You know, and of course, then when you lose your transformational guy, it's um, it's a tough thing. Now, Chuck. Has you know has always had teams ready to play. They play hard for him. I mean, it isn't really even this year. Uh, you know, with all the injuries and the record and the you know some of the terrible statistics. I mean, you got to remember they've blown seven double-digit leads at the half out of nine losses. So I mean, it's not like you know it's really not like they haven't post up and they'll post up Sunday. I I guarantee you in Baltimore they'll post up, but. You know, at the same time, they just aren't good enough in any area to play 60 minutes. And that's what unravels. They unravel in some area of the game over 60 minutes. Not about emotion. It's, it's really just about competence over a long period of time. Rick Venturi joining us here from Indianapolis. This portion of our WNST programming brought to you by Lee Tessier and his team at Keller Williams American Premier Realty. List your home with him and risk nothing. His team will get your house sold. LeeTessier.com. Also brought to you by Costas Inn. Good enough for the Today Show and my mom. The fat crabs, the cold beer, all the things that Rick Venturi misses about Baltimore. The legend continues. It is CostasInn.com. Rick Venturi uh, joining us here from Indianapolis. and You can find him uh, out there uh, in uh, you, you do not tweet, but the, your radio station at 1070, the fan, is followable. And I know you're uh, you're on the radio doing hits out there and doing television. you got a television show out there. Uh, for Indianapolis and, and this period of time, for the fans, and you were a part of trying to build it out there and packing the Mayflowers and all the bad that happened here at the end and the empty seats. You found a whole lot more of that in Indianapolis. And now I leave Cleveland and nobody's going to the games. Indianapolis is another place where... Peyton Manning and Bill Polian and Tony Dungy in that period of time and that special group of players with Saturday and the wide receivers and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Dwight Freeney built that stadium literally right like I mean the, literally they went, they went no. from one to the other based on success sustained civic pride all of that stuff Jimmy wiping away the ghost of the old man and trying to make yep. it right and all that stuff. And now it's a leaky boat again. It's three and eleven, and there aren't many good players. And and then you got to go sell tickets at a very very high level out in a market that you know it's doing okay, but it's not growing. And it certainly wasn't a growing market in 1984 when Tiger Bob found it, right? No question about it. I mean, the difference in 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 Bob and Jim is overwhelming. I mean, you know, Bob was what he was. Uh, Jim, I think, learned really learned the game through Bob's mistakes and really has become one of the great owners, really, in the NFL. He gives these guys everything it possibly takes. I used to laugh about Bob. I used to say we had a salary cap with the Colts before there ever was one in existence. So, <laughs> But, um, you know, I think what's happened here is you're exactly right. When we came here, it was off those tough two years in Baltimore. 
um, kind of that low ebb period in Colts. And, you know, we didn't do much to, uh, to improve that. We finally, in 87, got Dickerson, you know, and ended up winning an NFC East and, you know, got a little bit better. But the Manning era... And then the first three years of luck is just spectacular. It's 14, I think it's 14 out of 15 years uh, in the playoffs, 10-plus winning seasons. Uh, you're exactly right, Nestor. They built a palace here. And it basically is built by the taxpayers of Indianapolis, I, I mean, and the state of Indiana. They, have, they merged tremendously here. Um, in that sense, the fan base has been great. I think what has happened is the last three years has been deflating. You know, when you when you have an era like that, uh, and it and it's so good, I, you 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 come to your standard becomes playoffs minimum. I mean, ten wins minimum. And you know, as we've gone through this last three years, and particularly this year, now down to the you know um, the three and eleven mark, uh, it just really. Um, you know, it's it's so deflating, and I I would say more than anything, this isn't a harsh city. The fan base still is a very, you know, almost forgiving uh, media. It's kind of a soft market in that sense, but there's just apathy now. It's almost like let's get this over with. Let's get a high draft pick. Let's get Andrew Luck back, and let's see if we can get this thing back. It's almost a, uh, you know, almost kind of a, to use a political term, malaise. Really, that I feel here now. I, that is the word I've been using in my ghost of Baltimore football past and present, malaise uh, for the present tense. Um, Rick Venturi joining us here. He was the Baltimore Colts linebackers coach in 1982 and 83. He's now out in Indianapolis doing radio and television, where he also was an interim, an interim head coach there. In 1991, for Bob Ursay, went on to work for the Cleveland Browns, and uh, you know you mentioned uh, your first job was in Baltimore. So was Bill Belichick's, and and maybe Belichick would disagree with this, and maybe you could talk about that with Green Bay because they've had two quarterbacks in Pittsburgh because they've had this sort of seamless transition from the Cower era to the Tomlin era. But uh, that's very very rare. This you know it is unsustainable to make the playoffs 14 out of 15 years, right? Like I they, to expect that 14 out of the next 15 you're going to make the playoffs it's kind of like whatever evil that's going to bestow the the Patriots franchise for let's say the next hundred years they've earned it at this point I mean you can only be so good for so long right yeah there's no question about it I mean and really you know since 93 since the advent of free agency you know and then the hard salary cap in this league it, it's really a testament to them and it's a testament to Bill I work with Bill uh, in Cleveland, Nick Saban, Bill Belichick, myself, we were together. And, you know, they, those two guys certainly weren't iconic in 93 and 94. Um, but, you know, they're tremendous at what they do. Uh, I think, you know, you, you can dislike him for different reasons. Uh, but they're, they're just, ha they're can't, there could not have been in, in the history of pro football a better pro football coach than Bill Belichick because, you know, with the salary cap, with the way teams change and, and move from year to year, you know, to be able to have that excellence over that amount of time is just incredible. And, you know, you even saw it Sunday. I mean, in a, you know, in a game that was one of the great games, and we need more of that in the NFL. We need those kinds of games that are tremendously played, that are chess matches, that are controversial, that come down to the last second you know, talented, talented coaches, my God, we need more of that kind of, those kinds of games. But, you know, in the end, they just don't crack. I mean, they, they really don't crack. It's almost amazing, uh, to, you know, to see that over and over again. And that is a testament to, uh, to that coaching staff and that symbiotic relationship between him and Brady. Uh, we've probably never seen it. Certainly, we've never seen it for that long a time. Rick, it's amazing. I mean, your career and, you know, you packed the boxes in Owings Mills for the Colts. <laughs> you also were there along with Kevin Byrne and Bob Eller and a bunch of other people yep. in art and David in 1995. And I was out there in Cleveland and seeing just how wretchedly rancid that organization has been for 20 years. And I mean, you coached in New Orleans for a long time where they had bags on their heads and, uh, you know, the storm came through and, uh, you know, almost took their franchise away. And then you were in St. Louis 
Louis, and the last time I remember you were doing radio out there, and Howard Balls or a bunch of my my St. Louis pals there. They've now lost their team, and uh, you know we have twenty thousand empty seats here. So, am I concerned we're losing the team tomorrow? No, but I know where it begins. I know where it fractures, and uh, and I've seen what happened in St. Louis. I mean, you took that job in 06 out there as the uh, assistant head coach and a linebackers coach. I, I'm sure you didn't think the team's not going to be there ten years later, right? Well, you know, uh, that's that's an interesting that you say that. Certainly, when I went there, no. In '06, uh, I went there with Jim Hazlitt. We had all been in New Orleans together. Um, you know, it was kind of at the end of the greatest show on turf era. There were still a few of those names, uh, you know, but the team was about finished. But we still had optimism, you know, and we we went eight and eight that first year, which probably was a you know, probably wasn't a good thing because I, I think we probably overestimated where we were, you know, and then until this year, they haven't had a non-losing season since that 06 season. Uh, but, but in 06, you three... found the full dome, right? Yeah, you found a, yeah. you and found the tough ticket when they had big games and you found Monday Night Football. I was out there that period of time. Kyle oh Bowler my went God, out with there. The, with the, you know, with the smoke when you'd come, when the greatest show on turf, that was one of the best places in the world. The old TWA dome, you know, was one of the greatest places to go. Uh, but you're right, you know, and, 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 and my career has been, you know, it's really been crazy. We really, we ought to write a book. I mean, <laughs> I was there with the Baltimore move. I was there. Um, when the Browns moved back, and I, I was within 18 days of coming back to Baltimore, making the full swing, if you can believe that. And then because I was, it was thought was, that Belichick was going to survive, Modell yeah, said Bel- it, Bill's going to be my coach. That's exactly, what, yeah. and we were, you know, and I was, I was on my way back, and I was happy. I was looking forward to making the full cycle. But in the meantime, I ended up getting a job with the Saints, which I was, I loved. I was there for 10 years. Uh, but I was also there. You're exactly right. In during Katrina, when we, you know, when we got moved out, I mean, it was three moves. Now, I will tell you one thing about St. Louis, and of course, I had been, you know, through two franchise moves and a franchise relocation temporarily. And about six years ago, I remember I was on the air. I was I was doing that by this time now in the in ten and eleven, and you know, I'm doing now. I'm doing on air radio and and television, and I remember. You know, people discounting the fact that the, the that the the Rams would ever leave. Oh no, they'll never leave. And I said, I I remember on the air saying, "Listen, I was in one of the greatest football cities in the world in Baltimore. I saw that leave. I was one of the greatest football cities in the world. I saw Cleveland leave." I said, "So don't think for one second that this team couldn't leave." And particularly with that L.A. chip that was sitting out there and has been sitting out there for so long. And Cronky was a businessman first, and you and know, Missouri in second, obviously, right? And like, a lot of people <laughs> in St. Louis, you know, said, "Well, you know, Rick is, you know, he's Chicken Little, you know, he's just, you know, they'll, they'll, this will never happen." And uh, you know, as soon as I saw the facts and figures and the inability to build that new stadium, you know, which hell, we can go back to Baltimore on that one. I mean, every team leaves because of the stadium. That I mean, <laughs> it goes back to the to the Brooklyn Dodgers for God's sake. So. I mean, that never changes, and that happened. And I do feel for my guys like Randy Character and Jim Thomas and Bernie Miklas and some of my really good friends who became contemporaries of mine. I mean, it's just sad to see those guys, you know, without a team. Now, you know, Bernie and I worked together at the Baltimore News American in 1984 and 85 in Sports First. So, uh, you know, I go back down that road as well from your Baltimore days and uh, uh, Bernie being the young kid running around there. Yeah. Now, you know, if the Colts would have just lasted another two or three years, I would have been the young kid running around there. But but instead, Rick, I spent 13 years with no team here, you know. And my memories, I had some Burt Jones memories in Croner and uh, the Ghost of the Post. I was at that game on Christmas Eve uh, when you were running around at Illinois and uh, and getting yeah. your feet wet as uh, an assistant at Purdue or whatever it was. But, uh, you know, it, it happens quickly when things go wrong. And, you know, I don't know that Indianapolis has the rope to be as bad as the Browns have been the last 15 years, right? Cleveland doesn't have the rope to be as bad as the Browns have been the last 15 I mean, it's all it's uncanny, isn't it, how, how horrific they've been and how long that's been. And you know what an incredible football environment that is. And those people are just down the street. And, uh, hey, I said you know what, if your team's going to suck during an era, at least you got the greatest basketball player maybe to ever live, and you're in the World Series every other year, at least playing playoff baseball at this point. But but it is very, very difficult 
I, I wondered on Sunday, Rick, I woke up at the you know Cleveland Marriott. I walked six blocks at 10.30 in the morning. There's no one out. Tickets are a dollar. There's going to be 50,000 empty seats. And, and I said to myself, I, I don't know what would possess you to come out and watch an 0-14 football team. You know, It's very, very difficult to do when your team's not winning, whether it's 3-11 and in Indianapolis. Uh, it's, it's tough for 8-6 and six in Baltimore because 8-6 and six isn't good enough. So I think that the expectation is it's win or else at this point, but maybe it's never really been anything other than that, quite frankly. Frankly, right? Well, you're, you're probably right. It, it, it probably has never been anything else. Now we've taken some hits. I mean, you know, we've you know we've had some issues that we didn't get on top of um, along the way. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of issues outside of the game. I think that has affected us to some degree. Um, you know, the game has changed a lot. I think it'll be cyclical. I think you know when you get here in late December and every game matters uh, like Sunday. And certainly, you get into January. I think you'll, you know, you'll get that interest back. But we've got a lot of work to do, PR-wise. You know, we let some things get away from us uh, from an image standpoint, and uh, you know, a lot of people are angry at the NFL right now and angry at some of the actions. And I don't want to get into the politics of it, but we have to fix it. We have to fix it from a business standpoint, and really, it comes down to that. But you know, in the end, the product has to be really good. Um, I think you're right. I think, you know, basically because basically television gives us such an insight today. I mean, you know, just you and I talking here, this is just another example of, you know, uh, analysis of a game and, and talking about a game, talk radio, television. I mean, you're, you're reanalyzing that game 18 times, and, you know, you're, you're seeing that game from 75 different angles. And so, you know, if it, you know, if that thing isn't, uh, if it isn't a great product and you're not winning, it's a, it's a heck of a lot easier to sit down in your living room and watch it. He is Rick Venturi, a, a longtime NFL coach in many places and uh, an incredible link to the, the history of Baltimore football in lots and lots of ways. Uh, he's doing sports radio out in Indianapolis at 1070, the fan, as well as his TV show out there. Some thoughts about where the Ravens are at this point at 8-6 and six with Flacco. I, I'll say this, uh, they're a better football team than they were in September and October, which I don't know that the Chiefs can say that. I don't, you know, I, I don't know how many teams can actually say that at this point. Is this tournament gets going here and the Ravens have an opportunity to do that but uh, you know the, the, the veterans Flacco Weddle Wallace Suggs all playing at a high level I like to see that in my Christmas week as I have hang, my, hang my on purple one festivus second. lights uh, are we on the air here Paul yep y yeah yeah hang on one second I uh, I can 